Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for taking the time to be here. I know we're all very busy people trying to make a big difference in our, in our roles. Our expectation today is to provide you with quality information that will aid you in that effort. Uh, we had great response to this webinar. Uh, over 400 people registered. We're seeing a wide variety of educators tuning in from superintendents, principals, instructional coaches, technology directors, teachers, librarians. Uh, so I think this demonstrates how deep the idea of one-to-one -one computing, one-to-one uh, -one learning really touches the entire uh, school community. I'm Ryan Quinn. I'm the Director of Marketing for Herf Jones Nystrom. Uh, joining me is our featured speaker, Sean McCusker, educational thought leader, one-to-one -one expert, and educator uh, from high school in Palatine, Illinois. Hello, Sean. How you doing? Good, thanks. Sean is very knowledgeable on this topic. He speaks frequently. He's also very passionate about this area. And he has a very, he has a very unique uh, perspective to share with you today. For those of you that aren't familiar with Herb Jones Nystrom's, we're a 100-year-old publishing, educational publishing company. Um, Maps and Globes have been our traditional business, atlases, hands-on programs, and now our flagship product, Stratologica, which I'll talk briefly about a little later in the broadcast. Um, you can join the conversation by sending your questions to us using the chat feature uh, or the questions feature. Uh, we're also going to be tweeting during this using the one-to-one -one promise. So if you're uh, if you're on Twitter, uh, you can follow the conversation there and even submit questions. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. We're going to share that with you along with the slides that uh, Sean is going to present. Uh, if you need a certificate of attendance, uh, please just email me. My email address will be included in the email that follows this webinar. All this information will be included in the, uh, the auto-generated email uh, that comes from GoToMeeting. Uh, a couple of resources that I want to familiarize you all with. Our blog is filled with great articles and thought-provoking thought pieces that uh, will keep you informed during this very rapidly changing period in education. And we also have a, a library of white papers on a variety of topics from one-to-one, -one, technology in the classroom, social media use, common core, uh, and social studies. The white paper we offer on one-to-one -one really uh, synthesizes the research available, not just research in the United States, but all around the world. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to hand this over to Sean, and he's going to take you through his, uh, his content. And Sean, I'm going to pass the keyboard over to you. Thank you very much. OK. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> um, just to give us a sense of where everyone is. When we talk about a topic like one-to-one, -one, you could be anywhere in that process. If you were like me, about two years ago, I had this idea, wouldn't it be great if we were one-to-one -one at my school? And I thought we would never get here. And through a series of different events and changes and the community support and some administrators who saw the value of this, we moved over. But um, to kind of help guide me, I think it would be great if we could, uh, Ryan, if you could run that poll. I just want to ask, where you're at in this process. Are you just thinking about one-to-one? -one? Are you in the process of transitioning, running a pilot right now? Are you firmly entrenched within one-to-one -one right now? Um, just to give us some sense. Um, and so because of that, um, you know, I mean, maybe it's not even something you're really too familiar with, but it's, it's out there and you're trying to figure out what this is all about. So if you could go ahead and if you're a panelist, or if you're um, listening right now, answer that question. We'll get some feedback on uh, how everyone's doing with that. Right. Um, I, I try to keep in mind the fact that when you come to one of these webinars, you've probably spent the entire day at school. And chances are you're in an office or tucked away somewhere quiet or hiding out somewhere with a group of people. And uh, you're probably um, just trying to get through the day. And so what I want to do is make sure that we, I, I try to keep it conceptual. I try to keep some, some ideas that you can really wrap your mind around and start giving you some sense of direction. Okay? So if you look at that poll, that's kind of telling. 5% um, of you have little to no technology. Don't feel bad. If you have no technology, uh, if you want, you can either communicate with me through Twitter or you know, I could try to provide some information for you. I started doing technology in my classroom. I was teaching at a school, didn't have very much in the way of funds, and I 
was garbage picking computers to make computer labs, only to be heartbroken when they told me that they couldn't pay, pay for a fire extinguisher, we had to throw away the computer lab. Um, if you're interested, then this is good. There's some um, framing of questions for you. And then we have 66% that are in some stage of, of really moving forward with that. That is where um, I can say that it's been a significant, uh, po significantly positive thing for me as a teacher. Uh, it's hard, though. I want to make it clear. I'm not going to try to pretend. You know, I don't, I've gone to some sessions where all you can think is, this person's a Kool-Aid drinker. Are they going to say anything that's bad? I want to share with you the realities of one-to-one -one so that you can take your instruction and your planning and do some wonderful things. That's the goal, to help you see the road ahead of you. Um, so what I did is I've tried to break down what we're talking about into um, three questions. And the three questions that we've got, if I can get it to go forward. It doesn't seem to want to advance, Ryan. I don't know if you can push that okay. forward for me. Great. There we go. Awesome. I start off with why one to one. Like, okay, all this discussion and all this trend, why are we doing this? There's a significant amount of money and effort and reevaluation that's involved in going one to one. Is it worth it? Because as teachers, but the first thing that we, you need to know if you want to work with teachers is that we have a dysfunction with time. Um, we count every minute. We waste 10 minutes on something else. We have to make that 10 minutes back. We pour some time into a non-content area, and we have to make sure that we balance. And so I want to see if we can find what that balance, where the benefit of going one-to-one -one is going to yield us a return. The next thing is, what are the actual effects of one-to-one -one learning? What's it going to do? What will you see? What will it look like? What experience is it like for teachers? And I kind of like to finish up at the end talking about a few ideas of what is the future of one-to-one -one learning? Once we get iPads, once America starts moving in this direction, and, and maybe one day there's a preponderance of schools that have one-to-one -one technology, what are we going to be looking at next? If I, wanted to be, if I wanted to be planning for the next phase of things, what could we be trying to invest some time in thinking about? Because I think we need to do that. With the world moving so fast, we have to stay a little bit ahead. Otherwise, we're just reacting to a very uh, fast-moving world of technology and education. So I'm going to just start with the, the first basic question. Uh, if you could advance it for me, Ryan. doesn't seem to want to grab a hold. Um, the first thing is, why one-to-one? -one? So uh, the first, I, I think it's important to start with something that I hold very dear. And that's that there are a lot of things that get in the way of learning. And as teachers, what makes you a professional is the ability to eliminate those distractions and to um, mitigate the, the barriers. And so when we go one-to-one, -one, you have to understand that an iPad is one of the favorite gaming platforms in the United States of America, and probably around the world at this point. You're bringing essentially an Xbox into your class. So there's going to be some substantive things like changes that are going to happen. You're bringing in the number one form of communication, like cell phones and iPads are how students communicate. So we're, we're putting that risk up against what we can accomplish. So you have to have a focus. And I like to tell people that I always put relationships first. No significant learning happens without a significant relationship. And the second that devices get in the way of the relationships in your class, put them aside. Put the devices aside. Um, the next thing is that your content is why you're here, too. If you're your content specialist in high school or if you're an elementary teacher, you have these obligations to the community to, to educate your students on this content. And when the content is inhibited by the devices, put them aside. But I believe that we can strengthen both relationships and we can enhance the content through the effective use of one-to-one. -one. Okay. And so we're going to talk big picture why one-to-one. -one. And later on, we'll talk about small, like your school's why that will drive you. So the next slide talks about workplace tasks and skills. And Richard Murnane is a professor at the Harvard um, Graduate School of Education. And he did some studies over a 40-year period um, from 1960. It actually goes back to 1960 all the way to 1998 about what technology does to learning. Um, and what it does to the workplace. And even though his study ends in 1998, it was published in 2003, um, what we can see is that with the increase of technology in any workplace, there is a sifting of the, resource, of the skills that are necessary. 
And the two most important, according to this uh, study, were expert thinking. But even more so than that, the ability to, com to communicate complex ideas across different methods. So for our students today, what that means is that we live in a world of information, a sea of information. And they're going to have to find the bits and pieces of that information and then transmit that information into an ability to communicate it in a variety of ways, be that a blog post or a, a poster or a video that they're going to have to create. And communicating those ideas is really what social media is about. But um, for education, we need to help them not just get information and process it, but then communicate it in complex ways. And I think that the iPads or the Chromebooks or whatever devices, the Kunos that are out there right now, are, are this is what people are seeing, the value of that. On the next slide is an updated version of Bloom's Taxonomy. Um, which is kind of obligatory in this conversation. Um, in 1956, when he came out with this, there's some differences from what most people who have started teaching in the last few years will see. Um, there were changes in 2000 where they moved the act of creation to the very top of Bloom's taxonomy. So the ultimate form of expression of understanding is creation. In fact, if you're getting into a one-to-one -one program and you can stop thinking about homework or tests, and you can start thinking in terms of individual expressions of learning. You can start changing the way you assess students. So rather than saying, did you do well on the test? You can ask, how effectively did you communicate and create uh, uh, an understanding, an expression of your learning? So Bloom's taxonomy is something that will help your teachers or staff or, or, or people that you're working with to understand where it is that we're actually going. If you get them to create, all those, sub, uh, those lower tasks will fall in line, and you can start working on them. All right. We'll go on to the next slide now, um, which is the SAMR model. Which we, there's a lot out there about the SAMR model, and there are some misconceptions, a couple that I want to address. The SAMR model is not an identity. Um, it's designed, basically, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, to show some levels of the implementation of technology from substitution where we simply go from paper and pencil to um, a device and a digital piece of paper, an 8.5 by 11 electronic copy. And then slowly over time, we learn to get a little bit more. We have direct substitutes for something with a little bit of an improvement. And then if you move forward, you can go to modification, where technology allows for significant redesign of things. We can redo what we're doing because technology supports it. And then finally, if the, the peak and the pinnacle of the SAMR model is redefinition, where you have done things that you could never have conceived possible, um, and we've changed education. And that's really what we're looking for. But the fact of the matter is that after two years of having iPads in my classroom, this is not an identity. There isn't an identity of redefinition. You can't, there's, I think the dotted line in this graph can be deceiving, because it makes people feel like you have to reach this bar. And above this bar, you're doing something good. And below this bar, you're doing something bad. I think in, real, in reality, it's something that is situational. You are situationally redefining something. But then the next day, you might go back and do something that's substitution for what you used to do. And the goal is to press yourself to higher incarnations of your work, more towards modification and redefinition. But in reality, you'll probably always have some augmentation and substitution. It's that we want to press ourselves to get the most out of these tools to get the best for our students. Um, which kind of brings us to the next discussion. Um, so if I go one-to-one, -one, if I get these tools in my classroom, what can I expect? So if you go forward to that next slide. All right. um, I think that everyone wants to know what their classroom is going to be like. And I'm going to just warn you that the first quarter of every year with one-to-one -one is a lot more stressful than it used to be because of all the issues of setting things up and the idea that you have to prepare people and the, the idea that you um, want to establish this foundation of, of stability in your room with apps and Wi-Fi and devices and rules. And so it's a little intense. But I think that every bit that you invest more in time in the first quarter, you will get back in the fourth quarter. Like I, I absolutely know that I was able to accomplish so much more. Uh, in the fourth quarter because of this. So we go forward. I think the biggest shock to me was that there were these myths that I thought were true. Uh, the first one is that their children are digital natives. That is so false. They use these devices for what they know, socialize, they, to socialize with their friends 
and to play games. And they're excellent at those things. They're not digital natives, though, because they, it takes them a completely different mindset to translate what devices can do, what a Chromebook can do, into, or an iPad can do, into the skills in your classroom. How do you grab a web page and make it a PDF file? And then how do you edit that PDF file? And then how do you save that PDF file? And even more so, what do you do if you're faced with information that you shouldn't be seeing? What's the appropriate way to act? So I think that that myth was a shock to me. I thought they would know. And I ended up having to teach them a lot of things that I assumed they would know. Uh, the next is that technology will make you a better teacher. It will not. It, it, technology will not make you any better a teacher than getting a new textbook will or getting new Bunsen burners would for a science teacher. It's just not a reality. The thing that makes you a better teacher is the ability to employ the tools that you have effectively in ways that support student learning. And that doesn't change. No different than the overhead, no different than the computer. But what one-to-one -one technology does allow you to do is harness every bit of information. You're connecting with the entire world. Um, I think the myth of instant engagement is another dangerous one. Boy, did that frustrate me. Because you have these devices that are a recreational distraction for our students. And then if you have your teachers and staff coming into the classroom thinking that the students will instantly engage, they will be horribly disappointed and horribly frustrated by this. Um, to give you some background about me as a teacher, I've been teaching for 19 years. I taught for three years in Catholic schools teaching junior high. Uh, concurrently with that, and my next career, I taught alternative high school um, for 12 years. I moved on to teach high school in an inner city public school, and during those times, I learned some great classroom management. And I really never even thought about the classroom management because I felt like I had it down. The next, when I brought iPads into my classroom, or when I started using phones regularly in my classroom, classroom management became something that was a daily thought process for me. I had to completely rethink what I saw as good and bad behavior. So I think um, that myth of instant engagement is going to be a rude awakening unless we can preface our programs with the fact that it's, it's a myth. And then saving time. iPads will save you time in some things and cost you time in other things. But in the end, um, you're going to have to evaluate where you spend your time. And including new, new things always requires letting some things go. I think that in line with the Common Core State Standards, what we're looking for is deeper, more reflective, and, uh, um, and uh, critical learning of less subject matter. Uh, and that's a trend that people are discussing right now. What will we let go in order to enrich and go deeper with the things that we actually do study? And if you don't have that conversation with your class in your school, it's going to get very frustrating as teachers try to meet timeline requirements that existed before we had these devices while they have these devices in their classroom. All right. Um, next, I think we probably should start talking about the benefits. If, if you told me, I, I thought of something that isn't on here. And I want to start with it, actually, because it's really important. If you told me I was going to lose my iPads, I would be upset because there's a whole class of students who never participated in my classroom before who um, participate now. The introvert can communicate in my class. They can post to a blog post. Their work is reviewed by their classmates. And though they may not feel comfortable raising their hand, that doesn't deny them the chance to frame their ideas and let them get reviewed by people. So that connection is so powerful. Um, so many more people are a part of the discussions in my class that it's really kind of hard to explain what that does to the learning in our room. We don't just have the three loudest extroverted people with the strongest voices and biggest opinions. We have a community of people talking on a much more even level than I've had before. Within that, then, is also this idea that we can create student choices. The students are going to be able to pick their work. Um, it very quickly became clear to me that I couldn't direct my students to just one place in the wide universe of technology. But if I taught them an idea and then turned them loose to find expressions or examples of that, that I was going to get a lot of, uh, I would yield great rewards from that. And then in the end, because they were coming up with their own individualized learning in, of different topics, I started doing a lot more creation. The iPad, the um, 
Chromebook, or whatever other devices you might use, even just the phones that you might have in your class, will allow them to create in different ways. Some students may not be able to write, but they can express in the form of a video really effectively. Other students don't have the ability to create a video, but they know how to animate like you won't believe. And because they're presenting information and learning in a format that's inspiring to them and that they love, they do a great job. Um, I have a student who um, is a musician who is probably pulling C's and B's in my class, but was a great addition to class. And what he eventually did is he asked if he could do an assignment where he wrote a song. And he ended up writing me a three-minute song about the industrial philosophers. And when he, I was so skeptical. But to this day, it, it strikes me as one of the best assignments that exemplifies that if you allow for different platforms to express learning, students will go beyond what they ever gave before. In creation, I like to tell people, when was the, what was the worksheet you most remember from grade school or elementary school? You probably don't remember any of those worksheets. It, it's just not realistic. But there's probably an assignment where you poured out your heart, and maybe you sat down with your mom or your dad or a brother or a sister, and you remember the experience. And you probably remember the lesson as well because you invested so heavily in something that was exciting and creative for you. Once you create those products, it's really powerful to connect with other people. So I think that one of the the next step beyond choice and creation is taking the work that students do and exposing that work to uh, the views of the public, connecting with other classrooms across the world, connecting with authors to come and talk about the topic that you've been looking into. And that connection adds validity. Today I had my students set up their kid blogs for their Genius Hour projects. They can search any person in all of world history and they can uh, pour their, t their time and efforts into creating uh, certain, finding certain information. And they can express it however they want. If they want to write a paragraph, if they want to create a video, if they want to create a thing link, whatever web tools they want to use. But then when that's exposed to other people, it's crazy powerful. If you look on the bottom of the page, um, if you have a, a phone or an iPad that has a QR code scanner, you can scan the QR code there. It'll take you to a video from a student in my class who was a confident person, but was an introvert in the sense that they didn't like, it was a lot of energy for them to talk in class. And they created a video. Now, they could have done a Venn diagram, which would have taken them probably 20 minutes. But they spent two or perhaps three days creating a video that talks about the differences between Adam Smith and Karl Marx. And if you can get to that video on YouTube and take a look at it at some point, you ask me if that student learned. And you tell me what was it that made that student invest hours and days researching a topic where she could have just done a simple Venn diagram. And it was the excitement of expression and sharing it with other people. Every time that video goes over another 500 views, she'll be in my office, even though she's not in my class, specifically to celebrate the fact that people have been cheering her on and criticizing her work. But the criticisms have actually honed her learning. And every time there's another comment, she learns more about Karl Marx because someone brings up a nuanced understanding of this topic, even a year later. Um, the next two on the list are student-directed units and self-modification. They both fall into the category of student-directed learning. Can we have units where the students don't have to work at a certain pace? They can learn at their own speed? Is that a possible possibility for this? Um, and then self-modification. In class, a student who has to ask for a teacher's help risks the stigma from other students as they go up and help the teacher. How many times can a student come to you in class before they start to feel some kind of negative peer pressure about how much they're talking to you? But with one-to-one -one technology, when they're writing, every student can have a Google document open on their computer or iPad. They can be writing. And I, on my laptop in front of the class, can be watching as they construct each part of their writing. They can watch the construction of a thesis. And if a student struggles with that, and I can work on creating a thesis, then I can set them off in the right direction because a well-crafted thesis is going to lay out the rest of the paper that they're writing. So um, if a student has problems um, reading or some kind of a tracking issue, we have, um, there are technologies that allow the computer to help read to them and track the words so that they can kind of push themselves to read faster. If they have vision issues, there's ways to modify the color 
the tone, the size of the font, and those things are things I see students modifying who've never had a 504 or have never had an IEP. So modifications I never would have made, they can make for themselves. Those are kind of a big deal and they represent a significant advance through one-to-one. -one. Because they have freedom, my students can engage in something they care about. Because they're sharing their work with other people, the work has validity because if only for the social respect that they get for doing good work, there's a, there's a return. And that redefines learning. I have found in the last two years that I have to tell my students enough. I have to put a limit on their work and their creation because otherwise they'll be doing too much. And I'll have parents ask me, okay, can you please let them know it's okay if they don't have 40 slides or the video isn't perfect because they need to study for another test. And that, that's a great problem for us to start to address. How do we slow them down in their learning and make them kind of back off because there's other learning too. That's a great economy of information problem that comes with this. So if we could go on to the next slide then. This is a perfect example of a side effect I didn't know. I love this picture. There's a girl in my class, her name is Dora, and she came to me very upset because I was asking her to do a technological um, expression of learning, and she didn't want to do that. And so. She came and said, I want to do sculpture, can I do art? And I was almost said no because my focus had been technology. But I had kind of had to trust the student that she would do some good work. She sculpted seven busts of industrial philosophers and then found the best quotes that really got to the heart of what these philosophers believed. And then she mounted them on what her dad called me up and asked, what, how could I make her do so much? And I told her, again, she could have made a crossword puzzle for this. So what you see before you on that slide could easily have been a crossword puzzle on a crossword puzzle generator that took maybe 20 minutes because she was passionate about using her skills and talents. The thing that made Dora Dora is that Dora was artistic and she was amazing with like the aesthetics of things. When she turned this in she said she was sorry because she didn't get a chance to paint it. And so that will give you some sense of like the investment that this can create. Um, so if we go on to the next slide then. I just wanted to throw in a couple of keys to success that have become apparent to me. So these are for both school and individual teacher. The first one is so important. Don't hand out iPads when you get, if you could go to the know your why. Don't hand out iPads. Don't give them Chromebooks. Don't discuss anything with the teachers in your school or your staff and staff development until they know why you're doing this. Otherwise, you have a tool. Giving people an iPad or a Chromebook and not telling them why they're using it is the equivalent of telling somebody in class that your lesson plan is iPad. It's like a science teacher saying, guess what today, our lesson plan is Bunsen burner. Or an English teacher saying, today our lesson is keyboard. That doesn't make any sense. The lesson is the objective and the deeper understanding and learning. So you as a community must describe your why. Because you're going to have challenges and that why is going to be your guiding post. It's going to be like, your, your divining rod, it's going to be your true north that you can pursue with all your might. And then you need to share that why as an administrator with all of your teachers. So if you go to the next slide, the why is like an umbrella and it covers what's essential and important. And anything that's outside of that, anything that's outside of that is going to be something that we leave behind. So it encompasses your school values, your, community, um, your community's concerns, your course objectives. And then what happens, if you could advance it, is that we have all of these content all issues, all of these tools, and all of these skills that are going to be consuming us. But the pervading why is going to allow you to make the judgment of what content is essential that can't be left behind. What tools must we buy, possess, get, teach, and what tools we don't teach and what skills are essential because it meets the goals of our school. It's like your mission. Schools, whether they be private or public, are, are democracies. And we need to address the needs that our community has. And taking that into consideration with the course objectives and like our common core standards, um, it's going to help us be clear on what can be left on the, road, on the side of the road and what must be brought with us in order for us to maintain our identities. Um, the next slide discusses uh, something really important. 
I think we went. I think we went ahead a little bit. I need the one with the scissors. Somehow we missed the socialize appropriate norms. Yeah, I think that one is after. That's right. Okay, so here's what I'll do. This goes back to socialize appropriate norms. So socializing appropriate norms works like this. Um, this iPad is the is a big, huge, bright, shiny, digital, sexy. And when you look at it and think of it that way, it's a distraction. It's a disco ball in class. You have to be able to tell your students how to put it away. And I, I like to think of it like shaving a haircut, like dun, 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 dun. And you need them to react by automatically knocking on the table two times. So when I say, uh, um, devices down, eyes up, you want your class to react to that and be able to put it away. And to be able to turn off their desire to go into 800,000 games or a website that's important, or the, their friend's blog that they want to read. We have to socialize them for when that's appropriate. Because right now, the, the youth of America have created the social norms for using iPads. And now we are going to try to counter the social norms that they have used in, and, and have been prevalent with some academic and professional norms that are going to be absolutely essential for when they go to a job interview someday. So that's where we start socializing those norms. If you could go. Um, to the next slide, please. I have the scissors here because I want to point out, in your head right now, when you're listening, decide what's more dangerous, a pair of scissors or an iPad. But then consider, there are 30 pairs of scissors in every classroom in America, and no parent walks in because of their scissors here and then pulls their child out. Scissors are two knives riveted together. They are sharp knives riveted together, no one would hesitate. And that's because every child in America, when they're handed a pair of scissors, I want you to imagine if a teacher handed you scissors right now, what, how would you carry them? And 99% of Americans will grab scissors, cup them in their hand, hold it to their chest, and walk very slowly wherever they're going. We don't worry about scissors because we've appropriately socialized the norms of scissor use. They don't represent a serious threat because we've appropriately socialized the norms of appropriate use. And if we can do that with iPads, then the iPad ceases to be an issue for us. The question is, can we take the scissors example and apply it to those iPads? And for you and your school, what are those rules? We don't want to be too restrictive or we limit the power of the iPad to connect with the rest of the world. But we also want to make reasonable safety, like reasonable understandings of what is safe and appropriate what to do when you go someplace you're not supposed to be or when you're contacted by someone you're not supposed to be contacted. Never put a picture of your face and your name in the same place. And other rules that become important for your community. And I've traveled to many, you know, I do quite a bit of traveling to different schools to help people out. And one of the things I know is that every school comes up with a different answer. What is your answer? What is your answer within your classroom? And what is your answer within your school and community? If we go on to the next slide. The next thing that's important, don't try to implement iPads at the same time you're doing five other intensive implementations. Don't change out your gradebook. Don't try to take on yet another different system of change because you're talking about something so pervasive that all of your systems are going to be affected by it. Um, in order to do that, you're going to have to focus a significant amount of your energies. And, and let's be honest, how many hours do you actually have face-to-face -face doing professional development? And that cur curriculum development, that's separate, professional development on technology. So in order for it to work, you have to focus on high-quality professional development. Build in that high-quality professional, but yeah, develop experts within your community who can do work for it. And if you can't do that, take the time to find the people who can train you to do that high-quality work. Um, I work with a lot of schools in that capacity where they're excellent teachers. They just need some sense of a philosophy for how this technology is going to support them. You're overwhelmed with information. You're overwhelmed with apps. You're overwhelmed with tools. And you have to start looking for what kind of tools can help you out. The ones that can take massive quantities, a fire hose of information, and help you whittle it down into what is essential. So. Administrators have to support teachers by doing this high quality professional development. But I'm going to make a suggestion. And knowing full well that I'm biased by the fact that I've managed, I've, I've organized ed camps for the last three years. 
allow teachers to share what they need. Let them let the, the needs of the teachers filter up into administration and allow them to address and share their professionalism. Share their successes with each other, but also allow them the freedom. Trust them to share the failures that they've gone through so that when they make a mistake, they can save other people from that mistake. And their failure was not for naught. And you don't have people repeating and echoing failures that can easily be shared. For bigger districts, I'd like to say it this way. How does a teacher in a math class in one high school share their behavioral successes with a Spanish teacher in a school in a different side of the district? Or even in a smaller level in a school, how does a kindergarten teacher's successes with implementing blogging go towards helping people who are teaching eighth grade in science classes? Can you cross those boundaries with your success? Because the best success is going to be the successes that allow your successes to filter across the artificial barriers that we create in our, class, our schools like grade levels, subject matter. Those things become irrelevant in, in some sense. They're, they're very valid and they're super important to us because they're our identity. But as an administrator, you have to allow that information to flow freely. Get a school hashtag, have a newsletter where individuals share their successes, and all those things are going to help you out. A great friend of mine who's a great sounding board, Beth Holland, um, likes to mention it this way. Failure is not an option, it's mandatory. If you don't press yourself to failures, you're not pushing and examining the importance of, of what you can get from these devices. You have to find that frontier where these things go from being effective to not being effective. Okay. If you could go on to the next one. Now, as teachers in the classroom focus on this, Imagine an iMovie trailer if you've ever used iMovie on an iPad, or imagine writing a paper in Google Docs. There's spell correct, there's grammar check. Technology today puts a high shine, an incredibly polished product out. But a student can give you, their work can yield an incredibly polished product that does not demonstrate learning. And because of that, we can't be bedazzled by you know, electronic glitter, for lack of a better way of describing it, because their products are incredibly good looking because they bought an expensive app. We have to look at what else we can do. And you have to engage in the process. For me as a teacher, engaging in, fo in, in evaluating the process of creation has allowed me to do less homework. Because instead of grading the paper, I'm on the document with students as they're writing their thesis statement. I'm commenting and chatting with them as they craft an opening sentence to their paragraph. I'm evaluating their supports. I'm telling them, this is a great line, but you need to give me evidence. Now, in a classroom of first graders, that might look like the teacher reading a story to the students and asking them, uh, as they go along, which parts of the story we're talking about. This is a, maybe talking about characterizations, maybe teaching um, vocabulary as they go along. but. It might be that the teacher is doing this and the students are working and holding up their products for the teacher as they progress and write. So the process of creation, if it's a video, is something you have to check in. Check in for everything. Check in for the whole essay. Check in for the research portion, the thesis creation, and you're going to get a lot more out of it. I think the days of just grading a product are long past. What that also does when you grade a product, uh, the process is it means that the work has to happen in class. And for me, I think parents have responded to this a lot. We do a lot of learning, but we work and we work on the process in class. I had a college student come back from Notre Dame University and I was a little choked up to find out that he said the guided reading and the process of reading an article and turning it into an essay was one of the things that he valued most at school. Um, and that's what we want. We want to provide them with the skills that are really going to make a difference when they go off to the places where they're going to make their lives. Because if we do that, they're going to make better lives. They're going to have a better chance of happiness, which is essentially what we are, we're all in the business of. So we can go forward to what is the future. I'm going to try to not spend too much time, but I want to lay out where this all goes. Once we have classes that are connected, once we have our students and teachers connecting with like experts outside of that, sharing their work and creating dynamic presentations of individualized learning expression. What does it mean? Um, look, we're on rethinking on task. So let me digress. Um, one of the things you're going to have to learn in the classroom 
is that a connected one-to-one -one classroom doesn't look like you think it does. If I'm speaking in class, students are going to go off in different places, and I can think of three or four different ways you can be distracted in an appropriate way. If I'm teaching and a student um, doesn't understand the background information for what I'm teaching, well, I give them permission, empower them to go look for that background information to catch up. And if a student sees something connected to what we're talking about and can tie that to their personal interest, well, I want them to go off on that tangential interest and search it to then raise their hand and share it. If a student doesn't have some, uh, needs to go and relearn something else that we learned, they might go and search that again too. So while my class in that graphic uh, pursues a learning objective, there's a lot of really good reasons that students can be on their devices somewhere else, but in a way that's going to contribute to class. And then you're going to have a student who's just off task, and they're doing Candy Crush Saga, and you're going to have to see what that looks like. And by the way, in those cases, just turn off the lights. Candy Crush Saga has a certain flashy color look to it, and you'll know. But um, you, our value in class is any time you leave the path that the class is on to get other information, that's fine, so long as when you return, you share that learning. If you found background information, tell us. If you needed something else that made it make more sense, share it with everyone so that your decision, your interest, is going to be something that contributes. It's like continuing to paddle the canoe in the right direction. You're aiding the process, not hurting it. Also, you can uh, have students who know what you're talking about. Well, why not tell them? Well, then go find out more about that. Give me more information and extend that lesson for us. So on task is a very hard thing to define. Um, and by the way, I was really proud when I made this because it was my way of expressing something that was so complex in my head. And when you get it on paper, you're just proud. It's exactly like the creation students are doing in class. Okay, now we can go on to the future of one-to-one. -one. Um, there's three things I want to talk about that I think are super important. Um, the first one is the idea of blended learning. For those of you who don't know, blended learning is a concept that within the school day, what would happen if a student who can learn the math lesson in 10 minutes is done with math in 10 minutes? What about a student who gets it? Think of the student you have this year who will learn the concept the second you frame the concept. And that for them, learning is a 40-minute delay in getting to the next interesting thing. What if we untethered them from our 50-minute periods? Really, we're talking about Carnegie units. What if we took the, the old industrialized idea of the assembly line learning where it's 50 minutes of each subject and we said, but we can reduce that to 10. But what about for another student who struggles with math and we can give them double periods? If your school has gone to extended learning time for students who struggle in a particular area, it's the same idea. And what if that schedule was entirely individualized for a student? Because what devices may allow for is the 100% individualization of the school day for students. Maybe not so much at first, but later on. And what could that possibly mean for us? And what could that do for your school? What if you need more reading and writing time? How could your school use a blended learning model to increase your instruction where it's needed and stop making students who've mastered something sit through 40 additional minutes of repetitive instruction? The next idea I want to talk about is something I think a lot about lately. It's the idea of paperless 2.0. If you go paper, if you get one-to-one, -one, you're going to have people who want to go paperless. Get rid of paper so that we can save money. And really, paperless as we know it, paperless 1.0, I like to say, is the idea of no paper. But what we do is we just replicate paper with, we replicate paper electronically. And even though our assignments aren't paper, they're 8.5 by 11 electronic signatures that are everything just as limited as paper. What's paperless 2.0 where what if we didn't define our projects by what could fit on a poster? What starts happening when an, an idea no longer needs to be contained by the amount of space on an 8.5 by 11 page? How do we give an essay when there isn't paper to limit it to three pages? How do we tear down those boundaries? I think as teachers, what we need to do is examine the possibilities of removing the artificial barriers that we have been limited by for so long. And we can tell a person, learn this idea and express it. It doesn't have to be 8.5 by 11 or poster size. It could be electronic or musical. It, it could be anything else that's interpretive. Um, what is the new level of paperless 2.0? I have an edudemic article that is going to be probably out 
usually it'll come out on a Friday, so perhaps tomorrow, that was about defining paperless 2.0. And then the final thing, and I think this is one of the most exciting parts, um, is the idea of redefining learning spaces. If you want to know anything about redefining learning spaces, you've got to go find a person named Don Orth online. Um, if you'll go to the next slide, please. There are two really powerful um, sources that I have here for you. The video by, uh, that on the left is by Don Orth. He um, created learning spaces at a school in California that are just amazing. Every day, every time you enter the room, you redesign the room around the specific learning task. And when you leave, you reset the room to a default. If you need there to be tables or walls or whiteboards, everything is flexible. And students come in, and, they, and, and if you imagine this for a second, they're not just going to use the electronic tools for learning that fit their specific learning objective. They're going to make the physical space surrounding them conducive to their learning objective, which is a huge idea. Does it make sense in a world where we have the most powerful tool for individualized learning that we've ever had to have students sit in rows staring at a teacher that was geared towards individual instruction? So um, the other uh, source that you have there is one by Carl Hooker, and he designed those pictures that you see in front of you. My off we just received five of those desks that you see that are on wheels and move. They represent mobile classroom desks that are a little bit more flexible. What does the classroom of the future look like? Uh, if you look at the picture on the top right, there's only 10 desks in that room, and only for the students who need it. But why do we care where the posture of the student, if they're doing creative things, the devices that free you from the desk allow you to express creativity, and beyond that, get out of the classroom to outside of the classroom where learning happens, are powerful things. Uh, I look forward to the day when I can redefine my classroom around each individual learning task, task. Because right now my desks that are traditional are in my way probably 90% of the time. So um, that's a general overview. And I hope that I've given you some sense of what you can expect, um, what one-to-one -one learning is, what you, how you can get it to help you with your school's needs, and also the direction that it might be going, so that you can find a place in the stream of conversations to learn. If you're not currently on Twitter, I suggest you go there. I've learned everything that's important to me and connected with some great people. All of my EdTech teacher people are people that I didn't even know until I connected with, um, with Twitter. It's a great place to find support and through resources like Herf Jones who are going to connect you with the best of information. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Sean. That was uh, very insightful. Um, extremely fascinating, especially some of the stories that you shared. Uh, about the student who uh, you allowed to uh, create a song for their project, and especially the one about the, the sculptures. That's uh, that, that's incredible. Uh, it's definitely uh, you know a great way for, for students to express themselves, uh, like like you've talked about. Um, if you guys if you guys have questions, we're going to start taking questions, um, uh, and as those come in. Um, We'll just go back over some of the things that we have. Again, this is going to be recorded. Uh, we'll have some resources out to you. All of the resources that Sean shared uh, through the QR codes, we'll have those available to you on our blog. We'll send you a link to that. Again, our white papers. Uh, and again, uh, our, our product, Stratologica, uh, it's a, our flagship product, uh, which is being adopted by districts around the country. It's a product that fits real, real nicely into one-to-one -one environments. Uh, and more, most importantly, it's being well received by those who have reviewed it in the Apple Store. Um, so if you do have an iPad, you can download it from the Apple uh, iTunes Store. It is free, uh, and you can unlock more functionality by going to uh, stratologica.com and starting a trial. Um, I just want to thank Sean for being here today. Um, we are getting some questions in. Um, Sean, you mentioned uh, a little bit about iPads and the Google Chromebooks. How much do devices matter in, in going one-to-one -one in, in, in these environments? Is, is it really not the device that matters so much? Sean, are you with us? Well, I think we've lost Sean. Yeah, I'm here. Um, oh, it okay. depends on your community. I'm here. Okay. okay. Um, 
it depends on your community. What are you trying to do and what are you trying to accomplish? Don't buy somebody else's dream. I mean, that's what we tell our students when they're trying to pick a college. Don't go where your friends go. Choose the place that, that provides you with what you need. So you need to look into what it is that you're trying to do. And if what you're trying to do um, is specifically something that the Chromebook supports, then go with that. Um, my school, we chose iPads. We felt like that gave us a certain mobility. Um, it was the expression that we wanted. It provided them with the ability to do um, more than just beyond writing. It was useful for PE, for, for music, and because of that, that was our choice. But that doesn't discount the Chromebook as a, as a powerful tool. You know, some schools are going to have to make decisions with price. The number one factor when it comes to technology is price, I think, for a lot of people. So what I would like to throw out to you is the idea that don't wrap yourself too closely. Um, don't, don't get too caught up in the platform because in 2010 there was no iPad. It's 2013 and now America is rushing in the direction of iPads but also into like Chromebooks. Do you think new technology will come out that will replace it at some point? I say teach the essentials of technology. Teach the essentials that are skills because when the technology changes your students will still be prepared. If you train them on an iPad they'll be lost the second they lose it. But if you train them on the bigger pictures of processing information and effectively using technology and being socialized for it, when the iPad changes they will still be um, enabled and empowered to do great things. Okay, great. Um, got a couple more questions coming in here. Sure. Um, what kind of advice uh, can you provide um, for getting the, the parents involved into the community and to support these ideas? Um, when you get iPads, it, it, it increases the, you're going to become a connected classroom. And so what I like to tell teachers is if you're trying to convince parents that it's good to connect your students outside of your classroom, there's probably no more effective way to do that than to connect your parents into the classroom. So when I do a debate about religions, it's, it can be sensitive if people are concerned about what are we talking about. I welcome the parents in as much as possible. I started by having students text their parents to ask them questions about the topic in class to get them to respond. Um, and then the parents are in, they're really excited by the fact that I'm asking for them to share their opinion. It also makes my class more rich with ideas and perspectives. It, it takes me out of a position of the sole um, voice of authority, and it allows my ideas to exist in a healthier balance of ideas. And uh, I think parents respect that because it, it allows their students to connect with the world, but it allows parents to visualize what's going on. The, the connected one-to-one -one classroom is transparent. What you do is visible, and they can go and come back to it and look at what's going on. Okay. I think we've got time for one or two more questions. Um, one question coming in is, how are other staff accepting the transition to one-to-one? -to -one? You're in a pilot one-to-one uh, -one program school okay. now. Well, last year we only had 300 devices and I had 110 of them in my classes. This year we've gone forward and uh, we have um, 1,500 devices in our school and it's raised questions. But I think that that's good. Um, there's nothing good comes from any group of, for lack of a better description, Kool-Aid drinkers talking in a vacuum. You need the people who are sold to talk to the people who have, res who have reservations. Don't ignore your skeptics. Your skeptic is going to make your program healthy and not out of control, um, you know, uh, a, a bus without a driver. And you need them to engage in the conversation to meet their needs. The skeptic is simply saying, I'm afraid I'm going to lose my effectiveness. And I'm afraid these devices will cost me something. And they should. Because a, a healthy skill in education is the ability to weed out the things that will pass and the things that won't. I'm involved in what I do because I believe that technology is not going away. And because of that, I believe that we should be masters of it. And the discussion to convince others about that is something that you cannot judge them. I, I'm frustrated when I hear people who are slow to take up technology called laggards. Because those are teachers trying to maintain their effectiveness for their students. So. Um, my advice would be to put those people in positions to share their feelings so that you can grow more effectively together as a community and not have a, a, an initiative that rips your community apart. That serves nobody, least of all the children. 
Okay, great. Sean, one thing that resonates is using technology to allow for unique expressions of learning. Do you have any resources that provide examples to help teachers break from the traditional test or the worksheet mentality? Absolutely. The, the site that is most effective for me, when I was using iPads, but I think it would be effective even if you don't have iPads, is um, the EdTech Teacher iPad As website. And even if you're using Chromebooks or other devices, that website has a, is broken down by what is your learning objective and what tool can accomplish it. So I will try to put into the chat, or if somebody out there listening is, is familiar with it, if you want to put the iPad As site out there. Um, the other resource for doing these things is Twitter chats. If you get on Twitter and you talk to and communicate with people about what it is that you want to do, uh, my first experience connecting with another classroom was because my friend Greg, who's an incredible teacher and a really intelligent technology integrator, asked me if I wanted to do a, a shared blog. And when I was nervous about it, he kind of walked me through it. And everything after that has just been a deluge of trying new things and sharing things with my students. So don't be afraid. You, it's going to be a little difficult, and you're going to make mistakes. But you will define a much richer playing field for your students once you take that risk. OK, great. Uh, last question, Sean. Um, do you have experience? Uh, are you experiencing issues with connectivity as students are streaming videos and researching? And how do you handle these issues as they occur? Um, I'm experiencing issues with uh, apps that don't work. I'm experiencing issues with incompatibilities with iOS 7. I'm experiencing issues with the progression of technology. Occasionally, we have Wi-Fi. I have to say that the, the infrastructure in my school is very, very sound. And I have people who are very supportive in my school. But that doesn't change the fact that when iOS 7 comes out, things aren't going to work. So my best advice to you is that when things don't work, don't lose your mind. Stay calm and focus on the solution. Because then your students will emulate that behavior. And then you will have trained students who are going to live in a technology-rich world to address responsibly the problems that are inherent in a technology-rich world. So um, when things go bad, if you can't get your technology back up, then go back old school. We taught for all those years with no technology. You can make it through that day. Always have a backup plan. In fact, the first rule of technology is that technology will fail you. What will you do then? And you'll know. Because we know what learning is. And if you're a teacher who's even remotely considering technology now, you're probably a teacher who's just looking out for the best interests of your students. And you'll know to pursue that when things go wrong. Fantastic. Uh, thanks again, Sean, for uh, presenting some of these, these great ideas. Um, a lot of people tuned in. I think a lot of people got uh, a lot out of it. There's a very active conversation uh, on Twitter right now. Um, Thank you for everybody who tuned in. Uh, make sure to look for some of the resources that Sean uh, introduced and, and some of the resources that I shared. Um, and uh, we'll follow up with you with, with an email. And that concludes our webinar for today. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Sean.